So, hello everyone. Um, I'm Matthew Taylor, Chief Executive of the RSA. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here for this evening's special event. Thank you for coming out in the rain or leaving worse, leaving in the sun and then turning into the rain on the way here. Who knows what weather they'll be when you leave. Um, can you make sure your mobile phone is switched to silent, but uh, you don't need to turn it off. You can get involved in the conversation online. The hashtag is RSA Skull. Um, we are also filming uh, tonight's event as normal and we're live streaming over the web. So welcome to everyone who's watching uh, online. Now, as the hashtag suggests, we're really pleased that this evening's event is a partnership between the RSA and the Skull Foundation. Our organizations have very similar missions to understand how it is that positive change takes place in society and to work to unleash people's creative capacities to make more of that change happen. We're delighted then to be joined by the president and CEO of the Skull Foundation, Sally Osberg, as our keynote speaker this evening, alongside strategist Roger Martin, who has for many years been a member of the foundation's board. Sally and Roger have distilled their vast combined experience of making good things happen in the world in a new book, Getting Beyond Better, How Social Entrepreneurship Works, which I read last weekend. It's an incredibly readable uh, book full of fantastic case studies that I've been boring with people with ever since. Um, <laughs> well, no, not boring them with. No, no, no. Inspiring them with. Yes, but yes, I don't tell yes. the story. I don't tell the story as well as you do. That's the reality of it. Um, <laughs> Tonight, they'll share with us some of the concrete lessons and practical models they recommend to businesses, policymakers, civil society organizations, and individuals working towards the goal of transformational social change. After Sally and Roger have spoken, um, I've got a few questions for them in follow-up, and then it'll be over to you. And I know we've got an audience, many of whom uh, are social entrepreneurs or budding social entrepreneurs or enthusiasts of social entrepreneurship, so I'm sure we're going to get lots of interesting questions and comments. So, without further ado, let's get started. Please join me in welcoming Roger Martin. And to speak first, I think, Sally Osberg. Well, thank you, Matthew, and it's great to, great to be here. Um, uh, wonderful, wonderful room, the history of social progress, and of course, really, that's our, that's our theme, how societies advance. I thought I'd start off by just um, speaking to a question we're often asked, which is why this book and why now? And there is a big picture answer to that question, and there's a more micro answer, and I'll start with the, with, the, with the macro answer. And that is, I think we all feel somewhat outdistanced by the problems, the scale, the scope, the urgency of the problems really confronting humanity and the planet. And so Roger and I really wanted to put to the test um, whether social entrepreneurs were up to this challenge, whether in fact there was a role for social entrepreneurs to play in tackling big systemic problems like inequality, like poverty, like um, uh, uh, lack of human rights, like climate change, and see whether social entrepreneurs were in fact playing a role in solving these, solving the, these problems. And that's really what led us to try to frame um, the book around this question of how societies change, how these big structural advances actually, actually happen. And there we came to the conclusion that really most social change has been driven either by government through policy innovation, through massive policy innovations. You have the Magna Carta in this country, you have the Civil Rights Act in the US, these, these massive, massive moments of change that, that governments drive. And then the other, of course, crucible of change is, is, um, is business and business innovation. And it's no accident that here at the Royal Society, you have Michael Faraday as one of, your, one of your members and Marie Curie. And so you have these fantastic agents of change whose innovations have really um, driven societies forward in, in uh, really significant ways. Uh, so that's kind of the macro, the macro environment for why this book and why now? Understand the role social entrepreneurship can play. The micro answer really tracks to our founder, Jeff Skoll, himself a phenomenal entrepreneur, one of the co-founders of, of eBay, who decided with his philanthropy that he really was attracted to a special kind of leader. That was an individual who brought the discipline and the drive and the the a determination to disrupt something that just wasn't optimal for much of humanity. Um, with the same, uh, the same spirit of an entrepreneur, a business entrepreneur. Jeff is a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, and he saw these other characters worldwide who were doing the same, who were bringing the same kind of um, uh, ability to solving societal problems. 
And that really resulted in the Skoll Foundation's emphasis on social entrepreneurs. And with that, really, Roger, um, of course, is, a, is an incredible asset, as you can imagine, on our board with his deep, deep knowledge of strategy. And he felt it was important for us to be more rather than less clear about what we meant uh, by calling someone a social entrepreneur, by defining social entrepreneurship. And that led us to um, uh, co-author a piece, uh, Social Entrepreneurship, The Case for Definition, which we published in the Stanford Social Innovation Review in 2007. And in that, uh, in that um, piece, we argued that social entrepreneurs drive equilibrium change. And so that is the central hypothesis that we bring to our work with social entrepreneurs at the, at the foundation. There is an unjust equilibrium, there's an unjust status quo, and the social entrepreneur doesn't aim for incremental improvement. The social entrepreneur aims to transform that system for the actors, for society, sustainably and permanently. And so um, with that article, we really, uh, we sent a shot over the bow of, um, of the, you know, the emerging field. And, um, Fast forward, uh, eight years later, we have a portfolio of 91 social entrepreneurs. It was time to go back and to test that, to test that hypothesis, to test that thinking, and to share what we've learned since. And so that's then the micro answer to why this book and why now. And it's been a, a fun journey if I just p pick up on, on that because uh, you know, at the Skoll Foundation, we realized uh, back uh, 15 or so years ago uh, that there wasn't a really clear definition of social entrepreneurship, but we had a belief that there was something that we could do that was uh, really important. And so we've tried to be you know, reflective practitioners as we go along. We're trying to learn more and develop a more precise uh, way of understanding social entrepreneurship so that we can pick uh, social entrepreneurs to support in, a, in the most intelligent way we can and most importantly, support them the most. So in figuring out how they do what they do well, what seems to work better versus, versus not, uh, and that's what, in part what the book is about, in part about defining social entrepreneurship, and in part about saying, here's how they do it, here are the success models. Uh, we, we hope to both help existing social entrepreneurs, uh, help uh, funders of social entrepreneurship pick and support uh, social entrepreneurs who then do well because the better social entrepreneurs who are funded charitably do, the more charitable organizations will uh, be interested in, in funding them. So that, that, that was in part uh, the purpose of the book. Uh, but one thing, one thing I would say that was a, a stunner to, to Sally and I, we, we, I mean, we were, we were sort of acting like often entrepreneurs do. They, the, they are the best customer for their product and they hope and imagine other people will like the product too. Uh, so the article, the Stanford Social Innovation Review article was for us. It was for us to be able to do a better job at what we were doing and we were sort of actually surprised at, at how interested other people were in it and that's one of the reasons for, for writing, uh, writing a book because it seemed to interest other people too. Is that it? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only asking for because now. for now, no, 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 because there's so much more in the book. So you, that's great. Yep. You've maximised the time for us to talk. That was the point. <laughs> yeah, no, <it's> brilliant. <laughs> um, the book's full of fantastic examples. So I'm going to put you both on the spot and ask you to give me both your favourite example. And I'll start with you, you Roger. What's your kind of your, the, the example of social entrepreneurship, which is a kind of ideal type from your perspective that kind of captures all the key elements. <laughs> Well, I, I probably have to, have to say Molly Melching and Tostan, even though I love a, love a whole bunch of the, uh, the stories. But I, I, I know I love that one because I usually cry a little bit when I describe it. Okay. Uh, so it's just so emotionally uh, charged. This is the, the wonderful woman who took on this, this uh, uh, generations-long practice of female genital mutilation. And it's just, you know, it's one of those things where it's just kind of horrible, right? Uh, um, uh, but it was ensconced in society in Senegal, where she started w uh, working, and in other pl uh, parts of uh, of Africa. And so many people had, you know, bent their proverbial picks on attempting to to do something to change. And what I uh, what I loved about Sally, or uh, <laughs> I love Sally, but I love <laughs> about Mo about <laughs> about Molly on this on this front. And it's and it's very much in the chapter on the first step of. Of, of successful social entrepreneurs, and that is managing uh, these tensions, uh, managing tensions between 
abhorring the current, the status quo, uh, but also appreciating it. Uh, because you've got to, uh, she, ha she figured out what I think the other uh, folks who tried hard to, to uh, create a solution didn't do. They said, well, this is bad, and so it should stop. She said, here's why it makes sense for mothers to have this happen to their daughters and fathers who love their daughters. They still have this happen to them. Here's how it makes sense while she still abhorred it. Uh, usually, usually it's one or the other. I abhor it so much I won't see how it makes sense, or uh, oh, I see how that makes sense, then I won't abhor it and I won't try to change whatever the it is. So she managed that, that tension beautifully. She managed the tension between bringing new expertise t uh, to bear, but also being an apprentice. Really saying, I have to be an apprentice to the smart people in the system to really learn about the system while being a, a, an expert at the same time. And then she managed the third tension, which is to, to both uh, see, see herself as needing to commit to a solution, to figure out a solution and then drive the heck out of it, which she has, but that only after much experimentation. Even though you know, with experimentation, time passed and more girls were being mutilated while well, time passed, but she had to experiment to get to the model for change. And this is a sort of a community-based model where the community itself says, uh, we, not somebody else is telling us, we are telling ourselves, we are committing to one another in the village to end this practice because it's actually bad for those uh, young girls. And then we're, and then we're gonna go to the next village and work with them in the same patient way to make it, uh, to make it happen. So there was a couple of things sort of about, about that story which I found particularly intriguing. So one is when we talk about entrepreneurship, I think people often have in mind the kind of idea of something fast. Yeah. You, know, here's an, you know, here's an idea, I'm going to go out, test it. Oh, well, it doesn't work, I'll do something else. That's that kind of serial entrepreneur. But she worked away at this issue for decades, yeah. decades. Yeah. Um, so there's something about kind of persistence and how you reconcile that with the notion of entrepreneurialism yes. as we have it. And the second thing I'd like you to comment on is that the other thing that I found really powerful, in fact, I quoted it quite a lot, even in the last couple of weeks, is, is that she understood that the fundamental problem was social norms. And it was mm -hmm. when she understood yep. that the problem was social norms that she understood that it didn't matter what these people were being told, what the hierarchy was telling them. Yep. It didn't really matter where their own self-interest lay, actually. Yeah. The thing that bound this together was social norms. And she had to build up an equivalent <coughs> social norm yes. amongst the same people, women, Yes. to tackle the existing social norm uh, of FGM. So t comment on those two things. Yes, no, I, I, th I think those are, those are bang on. And, and I think she, she also understood uh, sort of the kind of the network effect of, social, of the social norm. So, so your daughter, you, if, if you're a mother who said, no, we're, no, this is just bad, I'm not gonna do it, your daughter could never get married, right? So, so that norm, that norm had this sort of powerful, powerful uh, kind of network effect so that it, I think that pr what she probably realized is that that kept in, into the norm ambivalent mothers, uh, but she, then she could use that ambivalence in the, in the process to slowly turn the tide on the, on the social norm. And what about I, the persistence I, point? Sorry. What about the persistence? Oh, ab absolutely, uh, and and that's and that's why it's it's sort of this the, the uh, management of tensions is such a big thing. The abhorrence would make you less inclined to be willing to be persistent. Uh, but if but if you if you recognize that you've got to apprentice and experiment, you you will. Um, that having been said, I mean, I think I think there's a lot of mythology about how fast kind of change happens. So I, I do believe that we think entrepreneurs, it happens, you know, it happens just like that. And uh, one of my friends is uh, Bill Buxton, the guy who kind of was the primary inventor of multi-touch uh, that you're using on your, on your uh, Apple devices. And he points out that the computer mouse was one of the most important innovations in, you know, the, in modern history. And it took 30 years from the time it was demonstrated to work wonderfully and be orders of magnitude better graphical user interface to wide acceptance. 1965, the first was absolutely clear as a bell, and it wasn't until 1995, when it came on Windows 95, that the world 
actually relatively ubiquitously used the most. And, that, and, they're, and that's way out on the tail of the distribution on good things. So good, good things after the fact look quicker. <laughs> uh, during the time, even great ideas take a while, which, which I think just reinforces your persistence point, which is because even really good things take a while, unless you're persistent as an entrepreneur, chances are you'll bail bail out early. And yeah, and if, if, if Molly would have bailed out after a decade, all the, all the girls uh, uh, who reached puberty in Senegal would be mutilated. So, so Sunny, on, may, on. I, may I pick up on, oh, yeah. on a, a point uh, Roger made there um, around the, um, the way ideas actually, because there are, there are ideas in social entrepreneurship. There are, there are ideas around social norm change that Molly was putting forward. But I was really, I was really intrigued in, in, um, in looking at your history here to discover that the Royal Society had, um, was the first organization to put forward the idea of sustainability in an environmental context. And that was 1980. And of course, the Brundtland Commission then was 1987, so seven years later. And we've just had our first sustainable development goals. So think of that arc for an idea to really move through society and take hold. And it's only really now that people are putting sustainability and development together and appreciating that you know the society and the planet, the way we live, and the sustainability of our home have to be conjoined. So it's, there's, there are these arcs of ideas embedded in social entrepreneurship that really um, take time to take hold. So give me your favorite example, and I'm hoping you're gonna take us to, I'm hoping you're take to us ask to, me. I hope you're gonna take us to India. But, uh. <laughs> um, I think I will take you to India, but, um, but I think there are some folks in the room who are from organizations that the, social, that the Skull Foundation supports. Um, and so I don't want to offend any of them, and so I'm not going to pull an example from our portfolio. I'm going to pull one from um, that I thought Roger was going to do, but since he didn't do it, I will. And that is our, our mutual um, friend, Nandan Nelakani, of the Unique Identifier Authority of India. If those of you, do, how many of you have heard of Nandan Nelakani, the founder of Infosys, one, called the two, called three. the Bill Gates of India, you know, a very successful technology entrepreneur, um, a man of ideas, uh, your serial entrepreneur in some in some ways. But he wrote a book in 2008 called Imagining Reimagining India, and he put forward in this book a number of ideas. One of which was um, one of which was to give each Indian citizen a unique identification number. And that was an acknowledgement of the fact that more than a third of the Indian society were non-persons. They had no identification, no birth certificate, they couldn't vote, they couldn't access services, they couldn't send their kids to school. So they were in effect non-persons. So of course he understood technology, he understood the potential to use um, uh, bioinformatics in order to give people a unique identifier. But it was an idea. Well, the Prime Minister Singh, um, uh, the next year, taps him to implement that idea. And so he says, yes, he'll do this, but he'll do it in his own way, on his own terms. And so he's a terrific example, and this unique identification authority of India is a phenomenal example of social entrepreneurship, because it is neither government nor business innovation. In fact, he is adapting the principles and the practices of both government and both business to bring something new to the world that adds tremendous value to the Indian citizenry. So he uses this, inf this by those, you know, iris technology, eye technology, and fingerprint technology to get a 99.9% .9 accuracy rate for an identifier for every Indian citizen. But he makes it voluntary. So like business, right? It's not mandated. The government isn't saying everybody has to go out and get this. It's voluntary. So treating the Indian citizenry as customers. It's also non-proprietary. He develops the technology and he deploys it through these, um, uh, through myriad partners. So he has enrollment centers throughout the Indian society, not just in government offices, more than 30,000 partners. Well, they, his first threshold is 400 million, 
because that's the number of Indian citizens who don't have identification. He gets to that in relatively short order. Then it's 800 million, and then, um, then just last month, last Wednesday, last Wednesday, he's at a billion. billion. So in effect, almost the whole nation now has an ADAR number, this unique identifier. This means that the government, um, uh, government corruption in the welfare system, is um, is uh, is is much less likely because the resources can flow to to citizens. It means these citizens can access government services. Everybody wins. Banks use it to open bank accounts. So the private sector is using this. The public sector, it's um, and then you know there's some challenges around privacy and so on. With any innovation, of course, you get the the pushback. But phenomenal scale, phenomenal benefit to the society, phenomenal example of social entrepreneurship being neither government led or NGO led or private sector led, something very different that renegotiates what each of those sectors does best to create something new and valuable to the world and to really drive change. So, so let me ask you one last question before I bring the, uh, uh, bring the audience um, in. I, I was actually involved, I worked in uh, government when uh, we were trying to do an ID card. Now that involved hundreds of millions as well, but unfortunately it was hundreds of millions of pounds. <laughs> uh, the number of people it involved was zero. So um, uh, we, we had a gun registry in Canada that was very similar. Yeah, very good, yeah. Only so, it was billions of dollars. Yeah. I wish we had a gun registry in the US. Um, <laughs> What that takes me to is the environments which are conducive to social enterprise. So your book is fascinating on some heroic individuals and some wonderful work that they've done. But I'm kind of interested about, are there particular places, times, environments where social enterprise is more likely to succeed? Or does it, is, is your view a kind of ad hominem view that it comes down to these kind of heroic individuals? Roger, do you want to start? Well... There certainly yeah. seem to be times, epochs, yeah. don't there? Like, yeah. you know, it is Elizabethan England or the golden age of yes. Netherlands or, you know, when, when more innovation flourishes. Yeah. I mean, that may be the case. I'll I tell you what, what, a, what feels to me to be the case is, is a, a, a sort of a terribly pressing and seemingly insoluble problem is, the, is sort of the motivator. Like, like when, when, I, when I ask the question, well, wh why, why were these people doing what they're doing? It's, it's they came across something, and, and for Molly, for a guy, it was accidental. She was there to do something else and came across, uh, across this. Or, you know, Hurt Weegens and his, and, his, and his hero rats. It's sort of like you can't get rid of the, the, the landmines uh, in, in Mozambique, and so, so you know, it's a, terrible, it's a terrible problem. It seems as though what happens is that the, the motivating factor is something that just sort of bugs the hell out of somebody who's, who's uh, looking at so it. So it is down and to the entrepreneur then? I, I, I think so, though I think, and the entrepreneur, the social entrepreneurs here from the school for portfolio and others here would probably just quibble with heroic, right? They would just, I, I think most of them just say, they just say, well, they saw something and they were, they were, they were there, and why don't I, why don't I fix it? Uh, and they get called heroes by other people, and, and us, and, and we think that of them. But the, the, the sort of idea that, that uh, they, they take it on in a heroic way just doesn't seem consistent with their, their personalities. They kind of see it as their job, um, and, and they're, and they, and they're they're really bothered by the fact that there appears to be no solution. They're bothered, we, we think, in, in, in the words of the book, by a stable and very unpleasant uh, equilibrium. Uh, and then they just sort of go to work. Um, and then people call them heroes uh, later, as opposed to them saying, I'm going to be the hero and take this on. I don't know if that makes sense Yeah, or yeah not. absolutely. I, I, and sadly, the last one for you. you. You can be a social entrepreneur I mean, I've seen an act, a, a kind of scale that says, well, social entrepreneurship stretches from people who are basically business people but want to do good to people who are basically do-gooders who want to find a way of making it sustainably fundable. And, you know, social enterprise can exist anywhere along that kind of spectrum. Is that right? And is, do you think social enterprise is equally found from people who are fundamentally driven by business and then think, hang on, I can do some good here, 
as people who want to do good and what they're driven by is how on earth do I pay for this? Yeah, um, you know, I'm less and less convinced that that's, that that's the motivator. I, I do see this, um, this, this um, recognition of a, system, a systemic problem and the discipline to go after understanding the actors, the forces, the incentives, the disincentives, what is holding that problem in place? And then this incredible creativity that's required to identify assets that may already be in the system that are under, under leveraged. We, we write about Amazon in the book, this organization in Brazil um, that, uh, you know, Brazil in the 90s was losing was losing rainforest at a phenomenal rate, you know, the size of Belgium every year. And they recognized that the government couldn't solve the problem. Brazil's GDP was growing massively because of the commodity markets. That created all the incentives for the ranchers to expand, for the loggers to go in, for the rogue loggers to go in. So you had all these forces working against conservation of the rainforest. So you had NGOs that just couldn't pull this pull this off. Well, Amazon figured out how to deploy satellite technology to get the government the real-time information about illegal incursions. Without that real-time information, they were getting information that was a year old. I mean, the, the, the battle was already lost. Um, so they, um, they figured out how to unlock the capability of government to do its job. They figured out how to incentivize corporations to care about the traceability of their commodities. So all of a sudden, you, the forces are starting to realign. Now, I don't think that's about finding a sustainable business model. That's about a model for change um, that's, that I think is a big differentiator for social entrepreneurship. So we, we tend to think around this very narrow social enterprise, more business-like revenue stream, or this sort of do-gooder as you, as, you, as you characterize it. I think it's something actually much bigger. You know, Roger has written extensively on ways of thinking and seeing the world, and I think this is very much a way of thinking and understanding. The model for change transcends the business model, transcends the organizational model. It enables the social entrepreneur to punch way above his or her weight, organizational weight, and it's what is required to accelerate to accelerate real change. Great. And, and if I can just chip in one, one thing. So I, I'm sort of trying to be as simple as possible and as practical as possible. And we've, all, we've long had a word called entrepreneur that we kind of know what, what it means and, and the like. And so, so the way I think about it is if we're gonna, ha we're gonna add a word, social, to it, we, get, we, have to, we have to use it for something other than what we used entrepreneur for. And for me, an important dividing line is is I, I'm, I'm game to call entrepreneurship, right? standard entrepreneurship with no modifier, uh, uh, the tackling of, a, of an unpleasant equilibrium where the customers are able to pay an amount that allows the uh, enterprise to make enough money to make it a good investment of, of capital. Right? Social entrepreneurs start, in my view, where the, the target beneficiaries just do not have the means to pay the total cost of doing their entire business and a, and a profit margin that makes it an, an attractive, uh, profitable investment. So they're in a, what I think of is they're in a trickier part of the spectrum where they've got to be super innovative in their business models. And I, I still think business models and all those terms apply. They have to be super, uh, uh, clever about their business model to figure out how to change the cost and value dynamics to, to somehow make an enterprise work despite that, that sort of higher bar of a, of a clientele that just can't you know, fork over the money. They're not like, like uh, PC customers. You know, uh, uh, Jobs and Wozniak come along with this little device called a personal computer and people can buy it and pay them enough to cover all their costs in a, prof in a profit margin. So that's how I make the distinction. So it's kind of social failure and a market failure combining, and the mm -hmm. entrepreneurs are looking through. Okay, yes. brilliant. Okay, so let's open it up to, uh, I've got thousands more questions, but I'm not going to ask them because I'm going to ask this lady here in the red top to start off the question. Tell us what your name is and um, that, uh, ask your question. Hi, uh, Isabel Kelly. Um, I'm actually a practitioner in residence at the Skoll Centre at the moment. Well, good for um, you. Used to be at Salesforce. Um, 
So I meet a lot of younger people that have just decided they want to be a social entrepreneur, but they don't particularly have an issue that they want to solve um, and go out looking for the issue. Um, do you think that you can solve other people's issues that you don't necessarily know that much about? Um, and what impact do you think that has on um, social change? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, this, this reminds me, I, I shouldn't tell this story, but I will, but anyway. So, <laughs> If you're not, not going to tell stories, you shouldn't be on stage, Roger. Just I know, <laughs> you're right. So, so uh, I, I graduated from Harvard Business School, and so I'm in the alumni record, so I get these Harvard Business School, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed Harvard Business School students coming to me and saying, would you invest in a search fund? And I say, what the hell is a search fund? They say, well, you give us money, uh, and then we'll go search for a business to buy and make lots of money on. And, and, I, and I have to tell them, the last. That would be the last thing I would ever imagine investing in. Sorry about that, but but uh, and so my answer is a little bit similar here, which is which is that is not that is not the method to be a great social entrepreneur. To me, the the great if I we look at the portfolio, these are people who ensconce themselves in something, and kind of figured out. Uh, almost accidentally that they were staring in the face of a miserable equilibrium and they they could fix it. Paul Rice goes hangs out and tries to help farmers uh, uh, coffee farmers in Nicaragua and and says man this is this is this day, this day ain't happening there I can't I can't fix their problem uh, the way the sort of the aid way we're we're normally doing it and then he becomes a social entrepreneur and boy does he understand the the Nicaraguan coffee farmers well so enough problem, to come up with it's something. it's a problem that drives entrepreneurialism, not the entrepreneurialism right, that exactly. helps identify the problem. Yeah. You agree? Exactly. Oh, yeah. I completely agree. It's, it's not this sort of in Kuwait, I want to be a social entrepreneur. It's this problem, I, I can't, it's not letting go of me. <laughs> and one of the, one of the discoveries we made um, in the course of working on this book was the role of expertise. It's fascinating to me how many social entrepreneurs actually come to their work through expertise, you know, uh, uh, um, Paul Farmer is in, you know, as a public health professional. He's an epidemiologist. He's a fantastic um, doctor, and it was that orientation that enabled him to see just these failures of health infrastructure in the developing in the developing world. And that, you know, over and over again, you think of social entrepreneurs as these generalists, but even a Molly Melching is coming to her awareness and deep understanding of the Senegalese culture through her work in languages. And so it's, it's, it's actually really fascinating to see how that expertise gets them into the sort of belly of the beast of the problem, but then they understand they have to apprentice themselves because they don't understand the context. Yeah. They don't understand why this problem exists in that particular context. So they have to apprentice themselves to the people who are the real stakeholders for the problem and ultimately for its solution. I like this. So this, it's this, this suggests to me that, that actually being a good anthropologist or sociologist is more important than being a good business person. <laughs> and as a sociologist, yes. who's rubbish at yes. business, business, I like yes. this. This is good. Well, the, the interesting thing to me is it takes that combination. So there's, there's if, if you take the, the stages we talk in the, in the book, you know, understanding, uh, that there takes the anthropologist, uh, ethnographer, sociologist to understand it. But then when you get to building a business model, that's when you got to kind of be hard nosed, uh, you know, and, and say, I got to worry about costs and value and the like. So it's a, it's a real, it's a, it's a combination of the, of the two. But, but I, don't, I don't think you can be a, yeah, a social entrepreneur by just being a business person. You've got to have, you've got to have that appreciation and understanding. But I would be encouraging to them. I mean, I, 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 would, say, I would say anybody, <laughs> anybody can, can, can do it, and you should just go out into the world to some cause that, you're, that, that, that motivates you, not as a social entrepreneur or somebody who wants to work on that cause. And, and, I, and I swear, within probably a couple of years, they'll have a conception of an equilibrium that is damn stable and that they hate, They'll get the motivation, and then but off, also, off they go. What I'm also hearing here, and I'll bring other people in, but what I'm also hearing is, is humility, which is that, mm -hmm. that, you, that, that what your advice would be is go out and just try and help people, help people in an existing system. Yeah. You know, go and work in a social care home, go and you know, live in a poorer part of town, go to work in, in development aid or whatever. Don't have great ideas, just 
live in that space, be yep. humble, listen to it, realise that problems only exist because there's good reasons for them to exist. Yes. And let the idea come to you. Don't rush around thinking, I've got a big brain, where am I going to you know, apply it? Yes. Got it. So okay. be the opposite of those Harvard MBAs. Yeah, very good. Okay. Uh, yeah, back there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Amma Marston. I have my own consultancy here in London working on some of these issues. Um, first, let me say that I really admire your work. Um, and I say that because I'd also like to ask a challenging question, um, particularly with recent controversies about um, lots of tech money or Wall Street money kind of going into some of these social causes, so lots of money um, going to the Gates Foundation and having a budget that is then larger than a lot of countries' governments. Um, and I'm wondering what role social entrepreneurs play between, I guess, the market and government's role to identify global common goods? Um, and are there any dangers for social entrepreneurs in navigating that space? Yeah, and I guess there's a kind of when things go wrong. You know, if you're in government and things go wrong, you're held accountable and you get voted out of office. If you're a social entrepreneur and you screw everything up, you can just go on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. But now, unlike a real entrepreneur or, an, or a traditional entrepreneur, it's not just your money you're losing. You may have caused social harm. And we all know that there are great examples that sounded fantastic on paper and yeah. then they kind of didn't work out in practice. I'm thinking, for example, of the children's roundabout that was going to be a water yeah. pump yeah. and failed. Yeah. even though on paper it looked absolutely amazing. Yeah. So what about this issue of kind of accountability for people who are in this space? Um, well, there are, there are a number of issues packed into, your, packed into your question. And I would say about social entrepreneurs, a differentiation, you brought, up the word, you brought up the word humility. But social entrepreneurs work with those who are most disadvantaged by the current equilibrium. So they are very much bottoms up actors and not looking to impose impose solutions. So real patient, real respectful, real solidarity with those they serve and ultimately they're interested in making those people more prosperous, more healthy, more successful so that they can drive accountability in governments. And social entrepreneurs I often say they're fighting on two fronts. They're fighting at the level of the existing equilibrium, whether it's in education or it's in water or it's in fisheries or whatever the existing problem is. But they're also, they're also challenging a development paradigm, a development paradigm that is top down, that assumes the West knows best, that this is what's good for you, that here's the new technology, whether it's the pump or whether it's the, you know, whether it's the uh, drone, that this is actually going to be in your best interest. And, and they challenge that. It's actually the people and their solidarity with those they serve that's the ultimate um, key to sustainability and uptake. And so they are, they're an antidote to that, um, to that pernicious kind of um, uh, top-down um, imposition that you're speaking to. And, and I guess in, in part an answer to your question, like I, I do think it's a, a, a challenge and um, I mean, I, I mean, I think by and large, more more money flowing uh, from the tech billionaires into philanthropy is is more good than uh, than bad. Uh, but I mean, I think there is a although, challenge. Although we'd like them to pay their taxes as well, wouldn't we? Uh, that would be very lovely. Yes, yeah. good. in some place other than Panama. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the uh, the um, but but like there's a whole bunch of fundamental attribution error issues. At, at, at work there, right, which is I made billions in this way, therefore this thing can be applied to all sorts of other other things uh, and and i and i do I, I, I kind of i I do think what what I hope we can do is create a model that says this thing called social entrepreneurship that looks like this is a good thing to fund so that they are so that they are rather than rather than casting about kind of imagining what might might work there's sort of a success models that they can they can uh, piggyback uh, on um, so that that money can be sort of as smartly deployed as possible now that's going to be smartly deployed in many other ways other than social entrepreneurship but but it it it's pretty clear to me and I think Sally would, would agree that that um, there's you know there's a lot more 
ph philanthropic dollars that could go to uh, spurring many more uh, uh, social uh, entrepreneurs. Like we, we have a strategy, which is to say we will, we will use our money to, uh, to help success, already successful social entrepreneurs uh, uh, scale. So we're, we're only looking at a piece of the, of the spectrum because we want to be able to focus on that and do and have, have the money we can invest do wonderful things. There's, there's all sorts of other spaces that we would love to see uh, uh, so, uh, f philanthropic uh, monies flow to uh, and we think that if we can show uh, how, this, how the success model looks, etc., that, that will help it. Uh, uh, that's my hope at least. Let, let's take two or three together now and we might get a couple of rounds. So we'll, we'll start. And is it a Twitter, a Twitter question? Great. Uh, a Twitter ah, question from Asia. That's from the Asia. kind of place. Okay. That's the kind of place the RSA is globally connected. Yeah, so we've got people watching online. So we've got uh, Gareth Wong has asked a question. So he said, given the recipe of best practice of social entrepreneurship set out by the book, it seems to him um, that the goals of Roger and Sally are helping to democratize social enterprise. If so, would it make sense for everyone to, and then he lists three things, self-challenge to be more meaningful and impactful, Number two, asking the right question and doing the right thing. And number three, collaborate and coordinate with others to maximize impact without recreating the will. Uh, one fine line between haves and haves not, thus not, being, uh, not only helping people in developing countries, but also our neighbors. For example, kids uh, who might overdose or rob us in months to come. He's curious to hear your thoughts. That's a long tweet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah. <laughs> that, that. Yeah, hello, my name's uh, Jonathan Carhill, I'm a, a fellow. Um, to be frank, I've always been rather puzzled by the term social entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And from some of the things that you've been talking, and I'm not familiar with the definition you arrived at, mm -hmm. but uh, you, 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 you said that it, it has, a, to, to me, it has, you echoed it, it has an element of dynamism about it and quick results and very much an individual driving, whereas some of the examples that you've given, particularly the one of Molly, etc., it strikes me that empathy is the key thing there, and that it's, it's not, it, empathy is the driver, and then expertise is brought to facilitate that, uh, m m answering the, the problems that your empathy has, has, has raised. Very good. Both questions, really, I think, about kind of attitude of mind, and yeah, well, yeah. Wait, for the, wait for the mic. Here it comes. Thank you. Paul Palmer is a fellow, um, and I'm director of a company called Principal Business. The question is about ethical entrepreneurship, be it social entrepreneurs or um, regular entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I, I give lectures at business schools, and I find the young people are really, because of a lot of corruption in the way things are in business, they want to start their own business. They have the energy and the idealism. And um, it's a question of, um, of getting it so that they, that energy is, is channeled in the right way. <clears throat> but what about the ethical dimension? Because often this is not mentioned. Okay. What do you have to say about that? Oh, they're all questions, really, about mindset, I think, mm -hmm. in one way or another, um, which you've kind of commented on. So do you want to add to what you... I mean, we, I think we've kind of agreed, haven't we, that what this starts with is empathy, understanding the problem, and the kind of entrepreneurial business bit is then the way in which you deliver the thing that you've committed to. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I, I, I think empathy is absolutely central, and it's central to, I think, any, any good business. Um, on, on the ethical point, because uh, I was a business school dean for 15 years, uh, and the, I guess what I, what I always believed is the fundamental uh, kind of sort of ethical challenge in business is, is to be focused always on a positive sum game, right? If, if you've got a business that's based on a zero sum game and I, if, I, if we get some of this, the consumer will get less or society will get less. Uh, if instead you, you, sort of, you sort of inculcate in people that the best business models are the ones where there are clear positive sum games. Yes, you make money as an enterprise, but you make consumers better off. You, you make society better, better off. Um, and I think we probably in business schools to, to great an extent just say if you can make a buck and obey the laws uh, You're you're okay, and you know that that makes the world a sort of a 
more miserable place rather than a, a wonderful place. Sonny? Yeah, I'll pick up a, um, the, the point about ethics, I think, is um, <laughs> it's the air social entrepreneurs breathe. It is, they, they are responding to this unjust equilibrium that is leaving people out, that is disadvantaging segments of, of, a, of, a, of a society, that is leading to oppression, to misery, to suffering. And that's, <laughs> that's their impetus, is to say, this is not right. And can I, can I find a solution for this so that everybody is better off? It's not a win-lose. Um, and so that, you know, that's the, air they, that's the air they breathe. The social entrepreneur is inherently ethical. I think empathy is a big, big piece of this, but it's, but, but it's coupled with this discipline and this mm. drive because you've got to solve, you, you've got to be resourceful. You've got to figure out what the assets are because you don't have all the money in the world flowing your, your way. Most of the money is flowing into very traditional um, uh, paths. So in the development field, you know, money is going into the same old solution that, that hasn't worked. And so you've got to find ways to divert that and to demonstrate that there's a better solution. So in the health in the health space, for example, the role of the community health worker. Several social entrepreneurs go right after that community health worker with technologies, with transportation, with other ways to make that community health worker far more effective. But that's an asset that's in the system that can be bolstered so that you are able to bring this solution of health care, health access, far more broadly. So it's, you know, it's a, it, it goes beyond empathy. It just doesn't start it may start there, but it goes beyond it to this, to this sustainable, systemic solution. And may, may, may I just, oh, just uh, very briefly. Yeah, just very briefly on, the, on our Asian friend, to just to affirm his point about <laughs> collaboration. Uh, these social entrepreneurs who are successful to a person all figure out that it's not about them, it's about putting together sort of an ecosystem to, to make it work. So I just want to affirm mm -hmm. that, 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 that uh, he or she is right on. And, and, sometimes it's, and sometimes it's actually even more strategic than collaboration because collaborations, you know, there are lots of collaborations where there is lots of time sunk in everybody gathering around the table. Um, but it's almost figuring out what everybody in the system is poised to do best so that they can do more of what they do, but we can, the social entrepreneur can try to connect the dots in a way that actually accelerates the change mechanism. So it goes beyond collaboration, it's far more strategic, and that's kind of the point too, that this is, this is, this is strategy. This isn't just an inchoate, do good impulse. Let's take another round of questions. A gentleman there, uh, there's a microphone coming towards you, here it comes. Thank you. My name's Ken Banks. Um, I'm curious, if there are so many problems in the world, why are we focusing so much on a very small subset of people who may become social entrepreneurs and almost ignoring everybody else out there who may not be a social entrepreneur but may be solving a problem in their community, may be doing good in the world, maybe doesn't have a very strong business model, but actually if you look at most social entrepreneurs, they don't have strong business models either. And being labelled a social entrepreneur opens up a huge number of possibilities for funding and for resources. I'm an Ashoka Fellow of, since 2011. The resources are incredible. I feel sorry for the people trying to solve problems who aren't Ashoka Fellows because they can't get those resources. So by simply defining this and trying to define it, are we creating a problem of sort of separating out a few select individuals and almost discriminating against them, probably tens of millions of other people who are also trying to make the world a better place but aren't labelled social entrepreneurs? Interesting. Uh, uh, yes, there's a gentleman here. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Manuel Meneses. I come from Mexico. Uh, and uh, there's a lot going on in Mexico and all over the world. You know, universities working to foster uh, social entrepreneurship and many organizations working with universities. Uh, I'm wondering, do you think, is there any pathway, any strategies to foster social entrepreneurship, where should we start? Which are the best examples you can find to develop more and more social entrepreneurship? Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a, I was in Chile last week and they were asking the same question, how can we create a more friendly environment for 
social entrepreneurship and public service innovation as well, uh, side by side. And then there's a, a hand here. Oh, you've gone away with the mic, but there's a third hand there. Thank you. And then we'll take the rest of the if we If we're quick, we can take another three. Hi, yep. I'm Russell. Um, essentially, the simple question I have is, is there a size limit to what social entrepreneurs can do? Um, a project that I have in mind is the Clean Up River River, which obviously involves a large number of organizations to talk to, etc. Should I just give up or? OK. You know? yeah. So are we in danger of a kind of social entrepreneur elitism? You have to have the label to get the money. Um, uh, there's a size issue. And what about places that feel they want more social entrepreneurship? What is the thing they should do if it's Mexico or Chile you know, or whatever to kind of get it going? I'd like to or London. speak to, um, to Mr. Banks's question around um, this elitism, because this is, this is not invidious at all. We, 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 are, we believe that social service providers play a phenomenally critical role in society. You know, the, the heavy lifting of making sure the hungry are fed or um, the, the, that the homeless are housed, this work in, that goes on in communities by social service providers is absolutely critical to healthy societies, whether it's a village in sub-Saharan Africa or it's a community here in, here, here in London. It's a, part of London, so it's not invidious. It's to distinguish sort of these layers. In the first article, we distinguished among social service providers, social advocates, and social entrepreneurs. And I think we've gone on in the book to say, yes, and business has a role to play, and government has a role to play, and everybody has to unlock this capacity to actually address these problems in a far more systemic way, and the social entrepreneur can play a role in that. But it's really about, characterizing these so we understand what we're talking about when we talk about social entrepreneurship. It is not invidious at all. Or maybe I'll pick up, pick, pick up the other, other two. Uh, on, the, on the last one, on the size, what we've figured out, at least we think we figured out at the Skoll uh, Fund, Foundation, is that in, in some of the areas, the next step is to put social entrepreneurs who are working on different aspects of a given problem together so that you can get an ecosystem of social entrepreneurs all working, working together. So we're, we're experimenting with that. We are, we're learning as we're going, but we hope we'll be able to tackle bigger problems in a bigger way with groups of, of uh, uh, social entrepreneurs. And then on the, uh, on the how do you spur it, uh, I mean, one little thing we've, we've done, uh, and I think there's a little, there's a little card that, that you, they can get with this. So we worked hard on a syllabus. So we now have a, a syllabus that we've produced that, that takes the best stuff that we think has been written on social entrepreneurship and, uh, and the territory to create a course for teaching. So, so that's one way if you start teaching this in business schools and economics departments and, and uh, sociology departments. Uh, so we're, that, that would be one way to, to spur it, is teach, teach uh, it as a discipline. Very good. Final set of brief questions there and there. Shall I start? Yeah, you go first. Yeah. Um, Phila de Purvis, I do solar lighting in East Africa. Um, it's back to the money point. Um, I mean, you know, most people when they're applying for funding don't write, I'm a social entrepreneur, you just get on with it. Um, and yet a lot of the funders, um, I mean, you don't need to distribute profit to be sustainable in, in your enterprise. Um, and let, uh, a lot of the funders, you know, won't even consider um, an enterprise unless it is distributing profit. Do you, um, do you see that? Do you talk? You, you were saying you want more philanthropy to flow. But to what extent do you as an organization engage with the range of different impact investors philanthropists um, who are supporting social enterprise in, in many different ways. Great, thank you. Yep. Uh, hi, my name is Marlies. I'm from WaterAid. Um, my role is not directly linked to social entrepreneurship, but um, I do uh, want to ask a question related to the fact that increasingly large international NGOs are investing um, more and more into building local capacity, and that includes um, supporting local entrepreneurship as well as local social entrepreneurship. And related to the previous uh, set of questions, as well as the financing one, um, those social entrepreneurs do not have access to the same systems 
questions that you might have in the developed world. And my question is really related again to what is it that those social entrepreneurs need other than funding, because most of them often don't even have a bank account or anything like that to kind of start their business. So what, what environment do you need to create in that situation? And what, do, what are they missing out that we actually already have access to in the developed world and what can we transfer to them? Great, and then I'm going to just a final question, and you've got three minutes to answer them. Um, I'll ask you a final question, abusing my position as chair. We, we, we at the RSA, we, we started talking about a, a, a terrible bit of jargon, but we used the phrase emergent impact. And what we mean by emergent impact is a sense that the kind of discourse about impact has got a bit stuck. There was a kind of notion that, that you could produce a number, and you could say, well, this in intervention achieves this impact, and it saves it. For every pound you spend on this intervention, it achieves this. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people spent a lot of time trying to work out these numbers, and they tended up to, to be a bit bogus, really. And, and also, they would tell you that something worked once. They wouldn't necessarily tell you it was ever going to work again. The notion of emergent impact is that you're looking at a system, and you're trying something out. And as you're trying it out, the system is changing, and new things are happening. And you're continuously adjusting and learning and doing what you're doing. So you have a clear goal in mind, but you're letting the method adapt and change as you understand the system and how the system is working. Now, the challenge with that is that would require different forms of funding and support, because you're not asking people to fund a particular intervention where you've designed every single element of it. You're asking people to fund a capacity to solve a problem, a network of people, for example, Roger, as, mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. as you said. So I'm interested in your thought about how we think about more flexible models of impact, as well as the two questions and your three minutes start now. Roger, why don't you start? <laughs> well, on, on that one, that's the approach that the Skoll Foundation has taken from the start. We, we, we weren't sure how we would do this, by what mechanisms, and we've, we've attempted to learn while we go. And so, so I mean, I, I, I think that's in new fields where you're trying to change something, create something that does not now exist. I think there is no choice but to do that. And, and if you do anything else, I, I think you, you'll, you'll end up recreating the past. Mm. First um, two questions. Uh, uh, the question about, the, um, about impact investing and networks and so on, we, we try really hard, to Roger's point about networks, we try very hard to bring people together to share knowledge, to share practice, to share emergent solutions so that people know what's working in the world and can get behind it. Um, but we also have structured the foundation so that we don't just make investments in not-for-profit organizations, we make investments with all our capital across the board. So we're making investments in entrepreneurs who we're working in um, we're working in renewables, for example. We're making investments in people like Elon Musk. So we're, we're making investments using all our capital, and there we're trying to say, we have money that can go to work to build a better world. We can do this at the foundation. We can do this at other foundations. We can do this with our capital in the world. So as you look at the sustainable development goals, you look at these 17 goals, and you look at the fact that they're going to cost, you know, two to three trillion dollars a year, We've got to have business. We've got to have government. We've got to put all these pools to capital to work to build the world that we all want to live in um, for the next 100 years. What a brilliant way to end. I, I can see you've done this before. Um, well, thank you very much. Sorry to those people who had questions I didn't call. But the great news is the Skoll Foundation have generously supported us in being able to have a glass of wine or soft drink and some canapes downstairs. So uh, at the end of the event, please go downstairs and carry on the conversation and indeed develop brilliant social entrepreneurial ideas downstairs by thinking hard about problems and being empathic. Um, I'm just bringing it all together. Uh, there are copies of this wonderful book, uh, Getting Beyond Better, outside, and I'm sure that Roger and Sally would be happy to sign it for you. It really is a, a great book, and the, some of the examples are really inspirational, so I'd encourage you to get hold of that before you go. So it just remains for me to thank you for coming and for asking your great questions and asking you to join me in thanking Roger Martin and Sally Osbo. Thank you. Thank you.